closed loop system of insulin with uh, CGM, which is also known as artificial pancreas. So I'll just show you a short video of what is artificial pancreas. So insulin pump throughout the whole life, there is currently no cure. It can be especially difficult managing blood glucose levels in very young children and that's because um, they can't really communicate very effectively when their glucose levels are high or when they're low. Um, they're very unpredictable in their behaviour so they won't tell you when they're about to run around and exercise which can cause low or high glucose levels. They won't um, always finish their meals. Um, which is a time when we need to give insulin. And so because of that unpredictable nature, it's very, very difficult for parents and caregivers to decide how much insulin to give when. Over the last 15 years, we've been working on the artificial pancreas project. And I'm thrilled that we've been able also to show how it works well in the very young children with type 1 diabetes. So the artificial pancreas comprises three things. There's a glucose sensor, which will be sitting on the skin. Then we have a computer program which is receiving the data from the cell sensor every five minutes. And when it's processing data, it will then tell an insulin pump how much insulin to give. And the communication through that is wireless as well. It also um, relays text messages to my phone when I'm at work and to be at school. Um, so we can bolus and everything can boost and ease off literally all from the phone. Um, we don't have to get the pump out to, to do anything. Um, and it's so much easier if we're out and about going for, for dinner. I can, not that I would do it discreetly, but it's just so easy. I can just um, bolus her food and, and off she goes and eats her dinner. So the closed loop um, therapy that we used in the study um, made a big difference to the children and the families on, on two different levels. One is that it improved um, glucose control in the very young children uh, compared to the sensor augmented pump therapy that they used for the other half of the study um, and which is currently standard therapy. Uh, and the other is that um, it really improved quality of life both for the children and for their parents and caregivers. And that's because the closed loop system automatically adjusts insulin delivery based on what the child's glucose levels are. So if they're running high, it will give more insulin. And if they're running low, then it will give less insulin. And it does that without the parents having to do anything. So it really reduced burden for the families um, whilst also improving glucose control. Yeah, I've got my sleep back. Um, I can not worry her about Sophia being at school um, because it's also easy for the teachers to um, manage um, and my mum as well knows a lot of what I know as well so when she's with mum I can relax knowing that she's okay. So, so this is uh, about closed loop system <clears throat> with CGM or artificial pancreas which is very very helpful to these children. Now, uh, just a word about complications. Uh, you are aware of what are the complications. Just to recapitulate, this uh, complications can be microvascular, which can be nephropathy, retinopathy, or macrovascular. It can be coronary artery disease, cerebrovascular accidents, and peripheral vascular disease. But if the diabetes is controlled properly, the chances of these uh, complications remain low. So, uh, few things about diabetic ketoacidosis, which we've seen in this child. So what is the pathophysiology of uh, DKA? Uh, it's been seen that severe insulinopenia leads to three physiological events. One is excessive glucose production and decreased glucose utilization, which raises serum glucose. This leads to osmotic diuresis, loss of electrolytes and fluids, dehydration, and activation of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, and accelerated potassium loss. It can lead to cerebral edema. So one has to be very careful while treating these children with IV fluids. Then the catabolic process also increased, leading to cellular losses of sodium, potassium, and phosphates. There's increased release of fatty acid, 
which increase the keto acid production and accumulation leading to ketone bodies and metabolic acidosis. So the clinical features are mainly vomiting, abdominal pain, drowsiness, hyperventilation due to acidosis, which is known as small breathing. There'll be smell of acetone on breath, signs of dehydration and hypovolemic shock. And if not recognized and treated, can lead to coma and death. What we saw in our case was, firstly, this child had vomiting. He had abdominal pain. He was a little drowsy. When hyperventilation was present, though acetone could not be smelt on the breath, but there were signs of dehydration. So these features were present in the child, and these features suggest type 1 diabetes. Most of the time, it might be overlooked because you're not expecting diabetes in such children. But always, always, again, I'll reiterate, please, whenever such a child comes, do a blood glucose and see. So uh, DK can be classified from anywhere from mild, moderate to severe, depending on the level of the bicarbonate, the pH, and the clinical features. So a mild would be, child would be oriented, alert, but fatigued, while severe would be, small, the depressed respiration, sleepy to depressed sensorium to coma. So prompt recognition and specialist team management is required in such cases. Initially, the airway breathing circulation like in any emergency. Then the fluid replacement therapy. That is the most important along with insulin. Electrolytes also have to be managed, uh, managed especially potassium. Otherwise, the child will remain in hypokalemia. Acidosis has to be corrected. It's been seen that once you correct, once you give IV fluids, acidosis is automatically corrected by on giving IV fluids and insulin. We don't have to give soda bicarb because soda bicarb is a double-edged sword. We have to use it very, very carefully. Otherwise, it can lead to cerebral edema and even death. So we must identify what is the cause of precipitation or diabetic ketoacidosis and treat the underlying cause. So initially, the treatment would be like was done in this child, first hour, give a bolus of 10 to 20 ml per kg of uh, normal saline along with insulin drip of 0.05 to 0.1 units per kg per hour. Fluid bolus, if required, may be repeated. Nothing should be given by mouth and a close monitoring has to be done. Second hour till DKA resolution, give half strength saline, continue insulin, also give potassium phosphate and potassium acetate 20 milliequivalent, 10 to 20 milliequivalents per liter. When the blood sugar levels or blood glucose levels come below 250 milligram per deciliter, add 5% dextrose to 0.5% saline. The total IV fluids for replacement therapy would be 85 ml per kg along with the calculate the maintenance amount. From this, you have to minus what bolus has been given to the child, divided into 23 hours. So some calculation would be required here and give the child fluids accordingly. Oral intake should be started when DK is under control and along with uh, subcutaneous insulin. So there should be no MSS, the bicarbonate should be more than 60 milliequivalents per liter and electrolytes level should be normal. That would be a management of DKA. Please again, I repeat, see to it that excessive fluids are not given, soda bicarb is not given, otherwise the child can go into cerebral edema. So this down below is shown how to calculate the fluids. I'm not going to that details. So this is the management of diabetic ketoacidosis. So um, at the end of my talk, these are the take home points, what I want to mention here. Diabetes, type one diabetes, the chronic illness and the body's inability to produce insulin. You have to give exogen, ins, exogenous insulin throughout life to these children, even when they're grown up and adults. A good diet control and a moderate activity is advised in these patients. So a dietitian has to be consulted and a diet chart has to be made for the child. One of the cornerstones of management is education of child and the parents. We should strive for a long-term management with regular clinical and lab monitoring. We must see that we can prevent and minimize the complication and see that the child is growing normally. So on the occasion of World Diabetes Day, let's take a pledge that we'll try and keep our diabetic children healthy and safe, ensure a balanced diet and insulin, ensure that the parents are doing a long-term monitoring of glucose and other monitoring and education. We must educate the parents and the child. 
So today being the World Diabetes Day, I think this was a very opportune time to talk about type 1 diabetes in children. Thank you so much for a very patient hearing.